Let's go to uh, Mike Snyder. And Mike, uh, one of my all-time favorites, and I think yours, has joined us, uh, Jim Mudcat Grant. Is, and he, does, he doesn't have the net, though. Remember you used to have that fishing net in the booth when he was broadcasting? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How you doing, Mike? How you doing, Mud? How's it been? Uh, it's been good. How's the golf game? Well, the golf game is good. Um, my team did fairly well today, but uh, it was a great day. The wind was blowing, keep you from getting hot. Uh, and the tribes, uh, uh, charities are going to make out real well. So it, it was wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Tanglewood's a beautiful country club, isn't it, Mud? Yes, it is. Um, uh, it's a little tough, though, for some of us. We don't hit the ball as far as we used to. It's a little tough. But uh, when you are raising money for charities, it doesn't make any difference, really. Mud, you got any idea what went on in Pittsburgh over the weekend? Is the last place Pirates <laughs> swept us? <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't mention that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it, if you've been watching the tribe over a period of years, it's about this time when they get into a little funk. There's two times a year they get into a little funk, and this is the time of year that they do, but they always rally, and they come back very strong. And um, uh, they're not too far out of first place, I think, a game or half a game. So it wasn't a tragedy, but uh, uh, it wasn't too cool to lose to that team down the turnpike, neither. <laughs> so I go with Mudcat Grant, uh, formerly of the Cleveland Indians. And uh, Mud, uh, what do you think about today's ball and uh, the pitchers, the hitters, uh, the way the game was played today? Any different from when you were playing in Mud? It's quite a difference from when uh, I played the game. But, uh, Mike, you got to remember, if you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren, they are quite different from the way we used to be. So what's happening is that the transition in life in terms of, of how the game played is dictated by the people that's running the game today that is much younger than you or I. So the game is a little bit different today, but it's a great game. Uh, they play uh, for the big bopper today. Uh, it's not played uh, from a discipline standpoint like it used to be played doesn't mean that it's not an entertaining game it's just a different game so when you're from my generation you got to think about grandkids and so forth and so on and it'll help you a lot mm-hmm. Mud, what do you think about the hitters today that take offense to being pitched inside i don't think much of it i think that uh... uh Satchel page says if you don't have a chest high fastball, he didn't really say it. I'm cleaning it up a little bit. But he said if you don't have a chest high fastball about four inches off the plate inside, you're not going to win very many ball games. Now, uh, the hitters know that when you pitch them inside, they are not going to be as good a hitters as they were before. So they're going to fight to keep the pitchers from throwing inside. And the commissioner is helping them. The umpire is helping them. So you can expect for more strikeouts, but you can expect for more home runs. You can expect a, a guy at second base hitting 12, 13, 14, 15 home runs where they never did that before because they couldn't run out there on the outside part of that plate or they couldn't stand too close uh, to the plate and take pitches away from you. So I don't, I don't like the way pitchers are not able to throw inside. I think you should throw inside to every hitter every time at the plate to let them know that there's a part of this play that belongs to me. Hmm. Mud, could you intimidate hitters when you were playing? I mean, with that fastball inside, could you actually intimidate hitters and get them off the plate? Yeah, they thought I was crazy. I, I mean, I pitched everyone inside. Now, I'm not saying that you should hit people, but you should have an inside off the plate fastball, and you should throw it at least once or twice to every hitter, every inning, every out, every time they come to the plate. So, yes, uh, I kept them off the plate, and then when I made a mistake, they hurt me. But uh, when I made a good pitch, I got them out. <laughs> you could actually keep them off the plate and then bo- get them leaning back and then hit that outside corner mud? Of course. Mm-hmm. That's what you wanted to do. And, of course, they got mad. Uh, but um, uh, <laughs> that's the way the game is. You know? how, how, many, they, how many fights were you in, mud? Any, any fights? One. And the guy that ran out to the mound, the next time he was in the on-deck circle, I threw at him in the on-deck circle. (laughs) (laughs) So so they said, this guy's nuts. They said, this guy's crazy. (laughs) Who who was that, bud? (laughs) 
I ain't gonna tell it. Oh, you can't tell. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And they threw, they threw at me too. Now you gotta, you know, gotta face the music. They threw at me too. Uh, but that was against the Baltimore Orioles and uh, Paul Richards was managing the Oreos, and I threw one at him in the dugout. <laughs> you see, you weren't going to miss anybody, were you, Mud? No, no. I didn't miss anybody, man. That's hey. a great one. You got him on the on-deck circle. That's right. Listen, <laughs> the game gets tough at times. This is really a tough game, but we've made it a very untough game. Mm-hmm. But it really is a tough game. And you got to, I, I think the reason, Mike, that a, a lot of pitchers don't throw inside is that they don't practice throwing inside. You, you, you can't do what you haven't taught your arm to do. And in, in spring training, uh, what we used to do is that pitchers used to stand up to the plate or uh, in the bullpen or wherever we were throwing. And we had a target that we could throw to and we practiced throwing inside. Now, when you don't practice throwing inside, then you can't do it. So when you try to throw inside, then you start hitting people. So I think what we need to do is that somebody needs to write an open letter to all pitchers to practice that thing, man. Throw off the plate inside, and that will keep the hitters. Now, I tell you what hitters are doing. They are wearing all kind of equipment Mm -hmm. today. And uh, uh, it's hard to intimidate them because you hit them. But if you... Whatever equipment that they have, there's always a little spot somewhere <laughs> that you can get. <laughs> and that's what you got to do. But we need you to sit down with Bartolo Colon. Is anybody from the Indians giving you a call? I mean, you, I mean that's really, that, that's probably what's keeping him from being an elite pitcher. Of course. You look at Pedro Martinez. They call him a headhunter. He really is not. He will throw inside. When you... Sometime, uh, my pitching coaches was Red Ruffin and Spud Chandler. They were the two of the toughest guys that I know. And they say, absolutely. When you are going to throw underneath the, the chin of a guy, you can make a mistake if you don't practice it. So you got to practice throwing underneath somebody's chin. Take your grandkids or somebody. Not, not grandkids. <laughs> if they're too young for that. But take your kids. Stand him up there. <laughs> Throw one underneath well, his chin. You're the man who, can, who coined the term chin music, right? I did. I, I did. A little chin music. There was much more chin music back in those days. But on a serious note, any pitcher that are going to be successful um, uh, constantly is the pitcher that will pitch inside. You just got to pitch inside. All of the pitchers today that are winning, uh, Maddox, Glavin, uh, Randy Johnson, they are absolutely afraid of Randy Johnson because they think he'll throw the ball right through them uh, inside. All of those guys that are winning are guys that are going to pitch inside. Mud, before we let you go, we're talking with Mudcat Grant of the Cleveland Indians, uh, pitch for the Indians, and Mud, uh, I worked with a guy that did an impersonation of you, Paul Tapier. Are you familiar with him? <laughs> I'm familiar with Paul Tuffy all the way back to when he was trying to sing. <laughs> Did you know he was with a group called the Doo Wops? No, I didn't know. You that. didn't know that? I didn't know that. I was working at the at the um, at the um, um, theatrical grill mm-hmm. uh, because I had a band. Mm-hmm. In fact, that band today, the Daz Band, has got a hit tune, "Let It Whip." But I started with them when they were kids, and Paul Tuffy was across the street uh, with a group called the Doo. Doo-wop. That's where I first met him, and I, he must have heard me talk or something. But for a white guy, he pretty good talking like a black guy. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't too bad. Yeah, he's not. He, oh, we used to laugh so hard. I mean, he had you down to a pat, you know that? Yes, month? he did. Yes, he did. He, he had me down. I'm gonna have to check his family tree. <laughs> hey, Mike. One personal question before I let you go. Yes. How old are you now? I'm 66 years old. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Good. You know, I have 19 grandbabies. I got 11 great grandbabies. And it's a funny thing about about the media and the news. When A-Rod signed that $250 million contract, mm-hmm. my great-grandkids thought I was making that kind of money. They said, they say, but, Papa, you used to play baseball. I know you're making that money. I said, well, well what do you want? My, my, granddaughter, my great-granddaughter told me I gave her $10. She looked at me and she says, what am I going to do with this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the most you made in one year? Can you tell us? I tell you, the most I made in one year, I think uh, it was about... Um, about about 
fifty-eight to sixty thousand dollars. But that was one year that I made that money. I won twenty games for the for the Twins in 1965, and Kevin Griffith offered me a two thousand dollar raise. So that's the way it was back in those days. But we didn't know too much about marketing back in those days. So it was, I, let me tell you something. I made more money in music. I made eight times more money in music than I did in baseball. Hmm. Now, this doesn't mean I don't love the game, except that uh, they were paying me much more to sing back in those days than they were paying me to play the game of baseball. No, rese- no resentment at all towards baseball? Absolutely no resentment because if I hadn't come to baseball, I would still be in that lumber mill down there making 36 cents an hour. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the game itself has done several things for me. First, the nickname uh, came when I started playing the baseball. A lot of people don't remember Jim Grant, but they remember Mudcat Grant. It allowed me to, to reach and to talk to thousands of children in and out of this country. It allowed me uh, to make an awful good living uh, through music because people saw me uh, as a baseball player first uh, while I was singing. But more than that, it allowed me to spend untold number of hours with families all over this country. Because when you met a family back in my generation, you stayed uh, friends with that family. You went to church with that family. You went to eat with that family. And now I'm in the third generation of those families uh, that I met. So the game itself has been wonderful to me. I have no complaints whatsoever. Mud, we're getting close to news, but I've got to ask you this question since you brought it up, the dif- difference between your real name and your, and your nickname. How did you get the name Mudcat Grant? Well, back in those days, um, uh, if you were an unsigned player, uh, they started you at the barracks, they checked you in the barracks in the Tona Beach, and then they took you to the clubhouse to give you your uniform. Well, you had to pass about four fields to get there, and the people that are on the field, the ball players, they let you have it. I mean, you could hear them talking. They, they, actually, they could scare you away if you weren't careful, but somebody was saying, look at who they're bringing now. Somebody said, yeah, I said, he's ugly, too. <laughs> so somebody else said, yeah, says, uh, he's an ugly mud cat from Mississippi. So when I got on the field, they started calling me Mississippi Mudcat, Mississippi Flapjack, Mississippi Hutcap. But after two weeks, they were calling me Mr. Grant. <laughs> <laughs> but the Mudcat stuck, and, and I appreciated that. And I know you got to go to the news, but you know I made the top 100 Cleveland Indian. And uh, that's such a wonderful thing. Can, can you imagine uh, Al Rosen uh, and Herbert Score and Bob Feller and Early Wynn and Bob Lemon and all that guys, Larry Doby guys that I play with, but I'm coming back in July, yeah. and they're going to introduce me as one of the top 100 players of the Cleveland Indians, and my grandkids are going to ask me for some more money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mud, time flies, huh? Time flies. It, it, it really does. Uh, from that old stadium to where they are now, from that old hotel at the Santa Rita in Tucson to where they are training now, from the uniforms back in those days to where they are now, from the money back in those days from where they are now. <laughs> but the town itself, um, uh, can you imagine what has happened at the time to the town because of the Cleveland Indians in this generation? It's been a wonderful role. It's been a wonderful thing, and I never will forget it. Mudcat, good luck to you, and I'll see you in July. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Mud. Mudcat Grant of the Cleveland Indians. Unbelievable stories, huh?